Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to our Zubi lecture. My name is Frank Sliegers. I'm Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture and uh, on organizing Zubi lecture. Uh, thanks to Nathan and Stacy for um, being behind the scenes and doing a lot of organization work. And uh, this uh, Zubi lecture is made possible through the endowment of Earth Zubi. And uh, yeah, we are happy. Uh, has been great so far. Even during this time, so you're getting used to it. And uh, yeah, we are also appreciating the different times. So um, uh, I also, before I want to uh, hand it over to Jack, uh, announce the uh, the next lecture. It's uh, not next week because we have in presentations. So it's in two weeks, 15th October, Justin Hollander. And uh, where have all the people gone? Studying density and the use of public space during COVID. So. Yeah, so keep keep staying tuned and um, join the lecture today. Okay, Jack. Good Good hand over Jack. Okay. My colleague, Good. Colleague, friend. Okay, it's um, it's my great pleasure to introduce my, my good friend Forrester and see today. Forrester, professor and former head of architecture and urban planning at Texas A&M University. He's also a senior fellow with the Hazard Reduction and Recovery Center. Prior to that, he was the founding director of the Interdisciplinary Design Institute and professor of architecture at Washington State University. And uh, for also taught for 10 years at the University of Georgia in landscape architecture. He holds uh, three degrees. Uh, he has a degree in zoology, landscape architecture, and a PhD in urban and regional planning. Forrester is internationally respected as a leader in the scholar of ecological planning and design. Published several books on the topic, including Ecological Planning, a Historical and Comparative, one prestigious choice best academic title award. His next Logical thinking practice is now in press. He writes more than even King, even without inventing uh, colorful demons. That's a joke, but I can't tell if you're laughing. Um, let's see where. Um, Mr. Hess served as a town planning and landscape architecture consultant to many communities and agents in Canada, the USA, Nigeria, and Kenya. He recently co-designed a master plan for a new medical city in Aqua Ibom, Nigeria. So this is around. Uh, Forrester has received numerous research awards. I'm not going to give all of them, but they include the, the Council of Educators and Landscape Architecture President's Award and the Georgia President's Award for Excellence in Professional Chief a Fellow of ASLA and a Fellow of CELA. He's currently Academy of Fellows and immediate secretary of the ASLA College of Fellows. Uh, but beyond all these pr impressive credentials, there is a beautiful, gentle, and fun person. I've had the person for over 30 years, and he never helped make me smile and laugh. His, his colleagues and students love and praise him. We're really, indeed, fortunate to have him speak with us today. When I invited him, of course, I had no idea that we would be doing this remotely. Uh, and so I'll, I'll get a pledge. We'll, we'll have to uh, to some kind of norm. First talk today is titled Maintaining Resilient and Enduring Urban Places in the Age of Climate Change. Please join me in giving my dear colleague, Forrest and Beast, Arousing exuber zoom. Can you hear that, Forrester? Everybody's clapping. <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, how do I share the screen? Uh, there's the green share button. If you move your mouse in Zoom, there's a green share button in the middle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just... Yep, yep, now it's coming <clears throat> up. And 
would you make sure you turn on the um, slideshow? I'm going to do it right now. Yeah, great. Uh, but but before I do it, I can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I I want to thank um, you all for inviting me. I was really looking forward to the opportunity of visiting Amherst. Like I was I was telling Jack, last time I came there, I came there as a student. We came out, I was going to school in Canada, and we came on a field trip. And Julius Fabus took us around and showed us all the beautiful landscapes. And I was looking forward to seeing them again, but perhaps not this time, uh, maybe in the future. Again, thank you so much for um, inviting me to be here. <clears throat> um, I'm going to tell you, basically tell you a story and the heart of that story is this question. Can urban landscapes be resilient, sustainable, and yet beautiful at the age of climate change? If they cannot, why? If they are, to what degree? So that would be the focus of my presentation this afternoon. Put differently, I'll be exploring ideas for creating and maintaining adaptive and regenerative urban places in the age of climate change. We know that landscapes evolve today in response to social, economic, political, and technological forces, population change and dynamics, urbanization, and climate change. These are the drivers of landscape, uh, uh, landscape evolution. And these trends are reflected on the landscape. If, for example, we look at the population of the United States, um, <clears throat> we'll find that, say, in 1960, the population was once almost 180 million. The MSA, Metropolitan Statistical Area, was 112 million, making 63% of the population. If you move to 2000, the metropolitan population is 80% and to projected 2020, 85%. That is very, very significant because it's saying that 85% of Americans are influenced in one way or the other by, uh, uh, in, or located in metropolitan area which has very significant ramification in terms of the use of the landscape. This trend also is, is global in some ways. And so there is a need to accommodate this growth. And what it does is that it places increased burden on landscapes to accommodate our daily needs for food, fiber, work, shelter, and recreation. Growth has many benefits, but it also has, it also has uh, ramifications, negative ramifications. For example, it modifies physical condition. And by this, I mean landscape fragmentation, disruption of hydrological circle, and it also disrupts the ecological function, which is the flow of energy, minerals, species, and information across the landscape mosaic. Climate change intensifies the overall effect. In the context of climate change, we do know that the burning of fossil fuel, land use, and agricultural practices lead to increased concentration of greenhouse gases and aerosols in the atmosphere, which in turn, greenhouse uh, uh, gases trap this, uh, reflect this long rate radiation, leading to increased warming of the earth. And, and ozone enriched atmosphere. And there are many trends to support this. If, for example, we just look at the uh, aggregate greenhouse emission, it has been increasing uh, significantly. From 1990 to 2016, it has increased by 46%, which is very significant. And different types of land uses produce uh, 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 contribute to this in different ways. If we look at the stressors, the stressors are those things that 
course, uh, <clears throat> those things that uh, um, lead to increased aerosol in the atmosphere. If we look at those things, this is a, it's, this has been done about four years ago, so the data is from four years. But if you look at the United States, you find that the areas that are the red are the places that are the main stresses. If you look at that, the uh, eastern seaboard and, and so forth. Now, if you look at the risk, where the effects are, the effects are mostly in the eastern part of the United States, not in the west, where some of the uh, 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 causes are. And then if you look at the capacity to deal with it, by this time we're looking at NGO, different uh, uh, non-profit organizations that are oriented to uh, uh, dealing with climate change, you find that the concentration is in the, in the center of the United States and to the West. What this means is that the areas that are most impacted are the areas that don't have the relative capacity to be able to handle them. And there are many. So we know that the impacts the um, vulnerability vary across regions. And the impacts are numerous from increased flooding to wildfires to increased mortality and morbidity due to extreme weather events and hit islands. Um, Guterres last year in New York, the United Nations Security said that science tells us that even if we are successful in limiting warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, to face significant increased risk to natural and human systems. Yet data shows that 2019 was already 1.1 degrees centigrade warmer than the pre-industrial era. Patricia Spinoza, Spinoza the Executive Secretary of UN Climate Change, <clears throat> concludes by noting that once a distance concern, climate change is now an existential and greatest challenge facing this generation. It is abundantly clear that business as usual is no longer good enough. Rapid and transformational changes is needed throughout society. I repeat, rapid and transformational change is needed, not only to reduce emission and stabilize global temperatures, but to build a safer, healthy, and more prosperous future. And that is our challenge, to build that prosperous future while at the same time reducing emission and stabilizing global temperatures. A lot has been done. A lot has been done by many people who could combat climate change as well as uh, um, manage the negative effects of growth. If there's uh, 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 this talent, Hannah Tanner was able to develop some kind of a framework to better understand these types of interventions. And these interventions are placed along a gradient from low specificity in terms of intervention to high specificity, and whether or not the urbanism is linked to existing city. And if you break it down, four different types of uh, uh, interventions emerge. Incrementalism, urban design and planning, Utopian and regionalism. Incrementalism is a small scale incremental improvements in the urban fabric. And basically it constitutes about 80% of interventions. And a lot of it has been recorded, documented. In the context of climate change again, a lot has been done. Uh, beginning in 1990, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has written a number of reports, most recently, in 2018, articulating different and tell us what the problem is and proposing solutions. And there are many, many work that has been done. But importantly for us also, there's been an entrance of social scientists, designers and planners in climate change science investigation. Just last year alone, I'm looking at reports, five major reports that developed by United Nations and related agencies that deal with explore relationship between climate change and land use to the state of global climate. Ultimately, all the solutions focus on three things, to eliminate CO2 and keep 
uh, 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 warming less than, uh, not above five, 1.5 degrees centigrade. And this is done through both mitigation and adaptation. And most of the things I'm going to talk about here will deal primarily with adaptation, coping with the effects of climate change. And in the past 25 years, numerous professional bodies from American Society of Landscape Architects to IFLA, and even just recently, even professional practice, Gensler just published uh, their climate change report uh, uh, two weeks ago. And also there's a lot of robust work done by researchers um, from various universities. But despite all these promising intervention and solutions, urban systems are complex, in connect, interconnected in very dynamic ways. And we're still only beginning to learn about how they relate to each other. So essentially, when I put all these things together, I see that what the conceptual challenge is to develop appropriate uh, spatial structures that are able to mitigate the combined effect of urban development and climate change. And we've had some success that have dealt, on your right side, have dealt with numerous outcomes or impacts and all that, um, but to varying degrees. What I'm suggest, proposing here is to add to the green body that currently exists. So three overarching questions emerge. How can we create livable, healthy, and sustainable places in cities that are resilient in the era of climate change? How can we ensure that these places continue to be sustained over time? And how can we ascertain that the quality and integrity of urban landscapes that provide these services do not deteriorate over time and arguably are enhanced? In order to do this, summarizing in terms of action, what I'm really looking for is a pathway for creating adaptive and regenerative urban places. To do this, I have to lean on a number of concepts from ecology, two important concepts. One deals with equilibrium, which drives the organization and conservation of ecosystems towards stability. And the, <clears throat> the, equi the pillars of ecology, the ecosystem concept rest on this balance of nature perspective, which has been Question. Today, now we know that nature is a patchwork that is characterized by disturbance, instability, and non equilibrium conditions. It is within the context of this question, question of equilibrium perspective, that ecologist Crawford Holland wrote his very important book, uh, article, Resilience and Stability of Ecological Systems, in which he questioned the stability of a uh, perspective. But he also introduced us to two fundamental concepts that could be used to measure the performance of ecological systems. One is resilience that determines the persistence of relationship between a system. And so it is it's a measure of the ability of the system to absorb changes and to persist. Persistence is the key. The other one which has been used uh, by, under the context of the ecosystem concept is stability, the ability of a system to return to an equilibrium state after disturbance. The more rapid it resists, it returns the le uh, with the least fluctuation, the more stable. And these are the two major uh, uh, um, ways the performance of ecosystems are measured. Uh, uh, Collins introduced the resiliency perspective. If we adopt Either of them, it has implications for urban design and planning. If we adopt the resiliency perspective, then our focus will be on persistence and adaptation, designing landscapes that can adapt over time. If we focus on equilibrium, we focus on being able to maintain a structure and function that will enable landscapes to recover or to resist change. So then, these then lead to the fundamental question, can we do both? Can cities, urban landscapes be resilient, stable, and yet beautiful in the context of climate change? That is the fundamental question I introduced at the beginning of my presentation. 
To be able to do this, you have to delve into resilience, and there are many, many concepts there that we found useful that will assist us in providing solutions to this. And I've listed some of them, like for resilient thinking, adaptive cycles, multiple states and threshold. We do know now that when landscapes evolve and grow, they grow two different phases. Traditional ecology talks about the first two phases, that is the growing, the youth, and the matured landscape. But now we know that in impact of turbulence or disturbances, there are other additional phases that could occur. These collapse and reorganization. When a system is too rigid, it may lead to collapse and it will affect the organization. So systems, the landscapes have to be flexible enough to be able to bounce back. <clears throat> and so in a nutshell then, a resilient system is one that can cope with shocks and disturbances and maintain its identity. You can see it over here. Yeah. But an unstable system will move and just a little perturbation will throw it over a threshold. Say for example, if moisture or water uh, it's deficient in a particular, say, a semi-arid landscape for a very long period of time. It may transform and move over to a more arid landscape. And that's the transformation that we're talking about. And also these systems, these are, occur at different scales, and this is what Panak is. So how can we translate some of these ecological concepts into action? I suggest some bridging concepts. And what I mean by bridging concepts are broad-based concepts that sh show some direction for uh, action. So one of the most important ones that emerges based on what we know is that the, uh, a new goal for urban design interventions emerge, how to manage predictable and unpredictable change. Because we know that landscapes are always in flux. And that suggests a number of uh, actions, resiliency thinking and action, thinking regionally, adapting to the context, uh, <clears throat> building up upon, uh, focusing on active restoration of landscapes, reduction in the ecological footprints, and adapting a, an ecological evolutionary land ethics, similar to uh, that proposed by Aldo Leopold. What are the specifics? I, I, I discuss about 10 of them here. One is this, to design for change and uncertainty, we need to start by organizing, designing faced first level organization of space and infrastructure. And also at the same time, while we design for land scale change, we look for incremental opportunities. And the focus our, of our intervention should be on the underlying structures, on the older elements of the landscape, the bedrock geology, the superficial geology, the geography, the hydrology, those systems change very slowly. And that is where we should start. So for example, in terms of basic organization of uh, space and infrastructure, this is an example whereby you're, you're looking at the basic drainage hydrological structures, you're, you're overlaying that in terms of both the geology, physiographical structures, and, and then the, the uh, vegetation. So once you do this, these then become the basic framework upon which subsequent uh, interventions will occur. And as a matter of fact, it even sets up a framework for green infrastructure. Two um, is that we need to develop to translate these ecological concepts into action in addition to things. And basically what I'm talking about is to develop a resiliency plan. To be able to develop a resiliency plan, we have to assume that cities are adaptive socio-ecological systems, always rebounding and made up of both social as well as uh, uh, ecological subsystems. And that, that interaction is particularly important and relevant in terms of being able to develop a resiliency plan. 
To develop a resiliency plan, I suggest a number of steps. One, building on some other work that we've done. One, establish what the resiliency issues are, the goals, scope. Two, you need to describe the system carefully in many ways, not only the boundaries, but the socio-ecological linkages. Three, you need to conduct a resiliency assessment, both, uh, and there are two types here, one dealing with generalized resiliency, that is resiliency of the overall system, overall landscape. Um, and then, and if you do that, I was trying to find a, a way to do that, but I, I came to the conclusion that, you know, suitability analysis at the regional of the scale, this is Stanton Island, developed by, uh, done by Ian McCarr in Design with Nature, that really it focuses on fitness and adaptation. And that is a good proxy for uh, resiliency as a uh, generalized resiliency assessment because it builds fitness of use to the landscape. But then we have to conduct more specific threshold analysis depending on what resiliency for what. In the say, for example, I live in College Station, flooding is a major issue in Houston. And so with respect to that, then you have to undertake very specific resiliency analysis with regard to flooding. And if you do that, then remember this diagram I showed earlier, in terms of uh, uh, threshold and, and the forces that govern it, then what you want to do in this case, I'm using this uh, Walker and Saul have developed a wonderful uh, uh, way to analyze this and I build up on what they do. But you look at what the drivers are, the controlling variables, the trash, at what point does the system tip? And what is the capacity for, for transformative change? It is when you undertake this that you can then begin to develop specific strategies, performance criteria, and then benchmarks for monitoring progress and to finalize the landscape resiliency plan. As a matter of fact, I have, why I've prescribed this I have not actually tested it, and I, I invite the faculty in your school but to have introduced it to my colleagues here to play around with it and see whether it works. It just seems conceptually that it might work. Well, the resiliency plan then becomes the context between which other interventions occur at different special skills. Two, we're informing regional thinking and action. And that is because Re regenerative changes as well as uh, uh, resiliency occurs best at the regional scale where ecological processes are slower than at the local scale. And there are many components of this regional thinking. In, in the context of application, some like in Texas here, they've done Envision uh, uh, Central Texas or Envision Utah, where they try to articulate a regional vision linked to a physical framework plan. This framework plan is also the basic organization of uh, uh, infrastructure and space that form this, like it's like this skeleton, form the skeleton within which other subsequent growth occurs. And drawing from that are other principles, ecological regionalism, which is clearly well stated in Ian McCock's uh, Design with Nature. In, in this case, the same example of, of uh, uh, um, um, Staten Island that looks at the relative suitability or composite suitability of various uh, uh, parcels of land in this area. And we do know that it works because in this plan on the left, in all these places in blue, Ian McCrack specifically recommended recreation and conservation. But yet, it was neglected and they built upon it. Well, when uh, Sandy occurred, see all these places here? Those were the places that flooded. Those were the places that flooded. So we do know to certain extent that it, it works. And this is what I mean at this scale can serve as a good proxy for generalized. Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, resiliency assessment. We should, it's also critical to maintain connectivity at all, 
all spatial plane. And that is because that connectivity and opens up the pathway for the flow of energy, minerals, species, and information across the landscape mosaic, which essentially is what ecological function is. And in doing so, we're able to establish and maintain corridors for the dispersal of and reproduction. As a matter of fact, climate change makes this even more critical because if these pathways are not open, it might lead to species extinction as species migrate north because of warming. And to utilize principles that we will know already from the island biogeography uh, in, in our designs to enhance ecological function, we do know larger patches are better than smaller patches. That instead of patches to be isolated, you connect them. And those kinds of principles, we're already doing them, but I'm just adding in terms of uh, what we're already doing. It is essential that we maintain the capacity of cities to continue to provide ecosystem services because it's an important function of resilient cities. And because ecosystems provide varying kinds of services from provisioning to regulating to cultural and, uh, and recreational, um, it is essential that our, it is imperative that we ensure that those services, landscapes continue to maintain those services. If you look at the central picture here, this is a wetland and it's a land. And we know wetlands serve many functions. They serve as storage and biological storage. They serve as a sink, they filter and so forth. So the question then is, if you go and convert this wetland to residential sites, they lose the ability to serve those functions. And so, for example, when it rains, there's no, nothing to hold up the water. So essentially, I use this wetland because that is easy to grasp. And it's fundamentally to ensure that as we design, we enhance the ability of landscapes to be able to make support the service. And as a matter of fact, sites is grounded on, on ecosystem services. We want to embrace re uh, regeneration because it is through regeneration that will expand natural cap capital uh, um, or to active the uh, restoration of the greater system that will expand national uh, capitals. Um, I, I think the easiest way to think about this is to think of your car you drive. If you continue driving your car over time, the performance will go down. And so you need to go and mean, uh, conduct maintenance. And that maintenance is the equivalent of regeneration. But because we're dealing with landscapes that cover vast extents, we don't really think about it. So that's the key to this, is to bring active restoration of the great systems. And there's a growing body of robust knowledge on uh, uh, regenerative systems. Um, <clears throat> and, and to be able to link that work that is being done to performance measures so that we can be more precise in terms of what is it we're talking about with conducting regeneration. And part of that regeneration entails allowing nature to heal itself. As shown in this example of the regeneration of the hydrological systems in the redevelopment of Stapleton Denver Airport. It used to be the former airport in Denver and it was uh, Translate it was a, a, a redesign for different kinds of uses. If you look through this, the abandoned airport, you see these are the drive, the dry runways. The runways cut across this hydrological corridor here and there. And the people who did it the first time forgot everything that was going there and just built the runway there. Um, uh, Andrew Pergon, Associates, one of the firms that came and worked on this. And after the analysis, they decided that if they use a traditional stormwater management plan, it will require an extensive and expensive rerouting of the sewer trend. Instead, what they decided to do was to go back and try to reclaim that landscape, that riparian system as shown here, 
and then use that operating system as the basis framework for subsequent development resulting in what we see here, which is a landscape, that multifunctional landscape, conserving that corridor, that the outcome looks like this. Um, and and the, the road network is exemplified by this. And that's really what I, I mean by uh, uh, allow nature, provide the opportunity for nature to heal itself. <clears throat> Six, climate change adaptation. There's a lot of work going on that. My contribution here is to allow climate change to serve as a context and text for engaging in design and planning interceptions. Yeah, I like to serve as a context and text for engaging climate change. We should also be committed to space, transforming spaces into places. It is only when we focus on that that we are able to have landscapes that are meaningful to the users. And this involves, amongst other things, not a commitment to place rather than space, a search for regional identity adapted to local situation, heightened sensitivity to regional and local influences, including climate, topography, material, and construction technology. And by the way, place, uh, places tend to generate social, high degree of social capital. And a high degree of social capital is closely correlated with uh, resiliency in urban centers. <clears throat> we have to implement performance-based interventions. And by performance, we're talking about the quantitative data about processes, services, and output of a system. Is the system doing what it's supposed to do? How well is it doing it? Accurately or accepted? At what pace? At with what level of productivity and with what level of risk? Uh, for eight years, I, ser I served as a vice president for research for the Landscape Architecture Foundation. And it was during this process that we developed this idea of landscape performance in the way, in the form in which it is. And landscape performance, LAF defines it as the efficiency and effectiveness with which solutions fulfill their intended purpose and contribute to sustainability and also to resilience. And so it is by getting these very quantitative measures, not everything can be quantified, let's agree, but we'll be able to be able to know when we get to or when we achieve or when we're making progress in terms of what we want to do. And right now, there are one, about 150 documented case studies in the Landscape Architecture uh, uh, Foundation website that were very found useful, both in terms of our educational material and also in terms of ways to actually uh, incorporate it. Know that landscape, as you know, landscape performance is now in the LAAB, uh, uh, one of the standards incorporated in LAAB, which was one of the things that we push very, very hard uh, to do. <clears throat> and we want to conserve energy at all special skill in the spirit of late sites and building uh, and, and living building challenge. <clears throat> because it's only when we do that, then we're able to begin by doing that, we're also mitigating some of the negative effects of climate change, particularly uh, urban heat islands. It is critically important that we embrace an integrated design management protocol where we see design and management as one part of the same issue, where management serves as an extension of the goals or ways to be able to ensure that the design goals are implemented. As John Lyle mentioned that management assumes a more critical role than has been usually expected. The interlocking relationship between design and management is a particular important feature of any ecosystem design process. And so usually as designers, we begin from the general to the specifics. 
seeking knowledge of the client, the site, the economies of the project, the user, et cetera, et cetera. And then we synthesize this information and it goes through a series of iteration to design, development, construction, construction administration, and then to implementation and monitoring. And typically these are seen as separate steps in the process, design, construction, management. What we're proposing here is that we should think of this as an integrated system so that all those parties are involved. In doing so, we're able to merge design construction uh, with design, construction and management as a single entity. And, and by the way, some firms are already doing that. Anthropogon uh, associates are already doing this in terms of here. So in, in that way, we ensure, we have a high degree of insurance that the design goals are actually implemented the way they're supposed to be. Lastly, we suggest, I suggest embracing an ecological evolutionary land ethics. If we look over history, we observe that there's usually a duality in terms of how people relate to nature. We see nature as self or nature as the other. When we see nature as the other, then nature is something we can use and abuse. If we take these uh, dialectic and put it in a horizontal and a vertical axis, we see four different components of sub paradigms self, self, self order, other self, and, and uh, other, uh, other self. And these represent different ethical positions. Self, self is reflected on preservation ethic of John Moore. Self order is a conservation ethic adopted by a proposed example is Aldo Leopold. Other self is still a conservation, but it's an anthropocentric ethic of Guilford Pinchot, and then a dominion ethic, which is what we want to avoid at all stages. So what I'm suggesting is that we are, are adopt, in reality, we can not necessarily adopt uh, a non-anthropologic uh, uh, agent. We, we have to, combine just a combination of the conversion ethics. Because that's, in fact, most federal agencies, let me go back, most federal agencies today work on this conservation ethic. It's an anthropocentric ethic in the tradition of uh, conservationist Gifford Pinchot. So, but importantly, what I'm suggesting here is to adopt an interdependency view of human nature relationships <clears throat> and this adoption has to be learned environmental stewardship is essential to be able to maintain it so if i look at these 11 principles i suggest the key to the effectiveness is the synergy amongst all of them where each particular one builds upon the other where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And in doing so, I offer that I talk about creating resilient, sustainable, and beautiful landscape. I offer that persistence is a function, is critical for Persistence of sustainability occurs uh, because of their resilience. And so we should replace one on the X dimension and you place uh, the other one on the Y dimension. And that is how you're able to maintain and sustain places over time. But having said all these things, there's still a lot of work that has to be done. A lot of work that has to be done. We still know very little in terms of climate change behavior. And it's, impact on landscape. We need new theoretical approaches and methods. We need reliable performance matrices. We must continue to learn from practice. And we need to have a deeper aesthetic understanding of landscapes. And I close by 
uh, quoting some of the work from Henry David Thoreau. Henry David Thoreau talked about really the adaptive capabilities of landscapes. That landscapes, nature less on the stop, establish a certain performance outline. And it's and if allowed to heal, will heal itself and restore it as much as practical to its former domain. What I'm suggesting is that some of these principles I've proposed in the context of their interacting, uh, synergistic interaction may in fact begin to propose opportunities for landscapes to begin to heal themselves. Thank you. Forrester, thank you. Um, as expected, you gave us a, a very uh, powerful, well-organized framework for thinking about the big contemporary issues that we're all facing now. And, and I believe um, resilience is um, right on, on top of um, many individuals, municipalities, governmental um, discussions about, about dealing with the present and the future. Um, so, and, and I appreciate that you have uh, developed this framework with these 11 different components um, because the, the, the challenge is um, highly complex. Uh, it's multidimensional, it's multi-scalar. Um, and, but I have been a little bit, um, a little bit uh, discouraged by even in our field that where a lot of the discussion about resiliency seems to be focused on one particular aspect of resiliency, which is um, a lot of work been done on coastal resiliency, uh, starting around New York City with the Rebuild by Design competition. And to a lot of landscape architects, resilience means um, protection from flooding. And of course, that's, that's, uh, that is one example um, but that, uh, that denies the, um, the economic dimensions of resiliency, um, the social uh, dimensions. So it's, it's very difficult to get specific and to make uh, proposals uh, without limit, kind of putting constraints on the, the inherent complexity of the topic. So I guess my question is, um, give, given all this complexity and all these dimensions, time dimensions, scale dimensions, economic, um, economic, geographic, um, social dimensions. Uh, who, who, who can manage a process like this? Um, and how, how could that actually work if a, if a city or a, a national government decided to get serious about resiliency and, and do the planning that, um, that you have argued for? I agree that it's um, it's needed, uh, but who could who could do that, and who who should do that, and how, how might that work? You know, I I I stated. Uh, thank you for your observations in terms of how it is it has been narrowly limited to areas along the coast and and all that, but also know that also that in terms of funding to be able to do work, it is easier to get funds when it's located along, along the coastal areas, unlike other places. If you need money from the federal government, there's a lot of funds available along the coastal areas. But if you, uh, first of all, I said that it should occur at the level of, the, it occurs best at the level of the region. Okay. First, that's number one. And two, and um, it becomes a slightly increasing uh, challenge because of the way regions are set up in the United States, in terms of whatever, and and so basically we have these uh, political regions that do not uh, coincide with you know ecological regions and all that. Yes. But some of the work that Fritz and Co did in in uh, Texas, in Central Texas, where six 
counties came together to develop a framework for change. That is a very good example of what could be done, at least at a gross scale. Okay. And then, but once that framework is done, like I talk about the first order organization of space and infrastructure, uh, a regional framework plan, once that is done, that then becomes the context with which other smaller interventions can occur because the fundamental framework is already set. Okay, thank you. I think um, I, I could talk with you for hours about this, um, but I'd, I'd like to uh, open it up for other questions from the audience. Nathan, do you have, do you have questions from chat or can you um, ask people to raise their hand if they would like to speak? Right. Yes, I asked earlier. Um, right now, it seems like we don't have uh, many questions. I have a question. Uh, relates to um, what Jack um, questioned too. Like, if you have this, and uh, thank you for your talk, Foster. Um, and I agree, like, yeah, we need, like, regional thinking. And, um, but uh, once that framework is existing or someone established it, who has the power to really implement it and the control? Because otherwise, if you're putting like restrictions somewhere here, when then the neighbors are saying, hey, okay, we're gonna, you know, like we used to do in, in back in Germany, we, we sold our uh, hazardous waste to East Germany. Well, you know, so it's not very forward thinking. Um, so how is it like, what are, I mean, the politically, I think it's a, political dilemma in a way or um, acceptance maybe of that too um, because every state wants to be maybe independent or uh, but as you see now it's not going to work because we are affected by these, uh, these things we are affected by climate change you know I mean you're right about that and like governance has to be critical if as in the case of those counties in central Texas, if they participated all along in that process, the onus is for the elected officials to use that framework as a foundation for the interventions they make in their own uh, communities. It is general enough in that context to be, to be adapted to suit the specific needs. But if that is not done, then it's just it's wasted. So what that means at, is at the outset, when you start to initiate it, you need the buy-in of all the key actors who have a role to play in the implementation. If that is not done, then we just wasted our time. Yep, right. No, Rob. Yo, Frank, you're mute. mute. Frank, you're mute. Yeah, that's fine. No, uh, Robert raised his hand. Just uh... okay. <laughs> you're muted, Robert. Robert, you muted. I, I allowed him to unmute himself. Go ahead, Professor Robert. I, I, I was blocked. I couldn't unmute yeah, my. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. About that. Thank you. So, uh, so great talk. A lot to lot to cover. A lot to think about. Very holistic. I think. Um, one thing I was thinking about when you mentioned the Texas example, it seems like the regional cooperations work when there's something really important at stake. For example, in some regions, it's their drinking water. Right, um, yep. and others it might be certain kinds of resources, um, you know, that they're trying to get. So, um, what do you think about that? Like, how do you tie in these other um, sort of planning needs into this larger thinking, right? Because we haven't talked about some things like Jack mentioned economics, job growth, um, you know, that sort of tension between development pressure and land protection. So. What are some of the hooks you think, in addition to climate change, that might motivate action? 
uh, it's, it's the uh, regional vision. Remember, in one of my slides, I showed that it's a, a kind of a regional vision that brings together environmental, social, and economic. Mm -hmm. That it is that regional vision within the context of of that regional vision that that it, that is framed within the climate change. So, like I said in one of my slides, I said that. The climate change should be a text and context. Mm -hmm. And so you develop all other, other things, interpreting it within the context of climate change. So, so in, in that way, it, and, and that vision, of course, really the vision is almost like a, a regional plan. Yeah. 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 That's how I see the regional plan. So, when I think of regions that have done some of this, it seems like Seattle has done that in some of their regional planning. The San Francisco Bay Area has attempted it, I know, um, in some of their recent sort of climate change plans. Um, so it seems to vary. I, it's amazing the Texas example because I don't always think of Texas as regional planning focus, but I know that county government is strong in Texas. So, so my follow-up question is, how do you think the structure of government then affects this, you know, regional type governments versus in New England, we're very localized and um, focused. Uh, you know, um, in the case of Texas, the major weakness of that plan is that it's a five area counties, including county where Austin is, mm -hmm. that developed the plan. But counties do not have zoning powers in Texas. Oh, okay. They don't. <laughs> so uh, what we're going to have here is a problem because it's the municipalities that have those powers. So there will probably be a fragmentation in terms of implementation because very little will be done at the county level and a lot will be done at the municipal level, which is a challenge I, I don't know how to resolve. But it's, it's based on how things are. So, and that is why if you come to Texas now, immediately you move outside the, uh, uh, the uh, municipalities, it's the land use changes significantly. So that's one of the challenges that we still have to address. Yeah, great, thanks. We have a question from Mark Hammond. Professor Mark Hammond, you can ask directly, Professor, if you want. Sure, uh, uh, Forster, I, I really very, very much enjoyed your lecture. I, I um, really love the integration of the different scales and 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 sort of linking um, contemporary practice to history and theory, linking planning and design together. So very much an integrative uh, work. Um, and the question I had was, I, as someone who teaches the the history and theory curriculum, um, I, ver I appreciated you um, invoking a lot of uh, celebrated figures from the past who have talked about ecological systems and conservation and so on. Um, and I just wonder the degree to which um, your work um, or your recommendations would um, incorporate aspects of traditional and indigenous knowledge, the contributions of, um, of non-European people to the discussion about sustainability and resilience. Thanks. I, I... I firmly believe that if you're engaged in a planning intervention, for that intervention to be effective, you have to bring to the table everyone who has either the knowledge, the resources, or affected by the decision at the outset of that 
activity. And, and it has to be done intentionally because it is crucial to the uh, success of that output. And, and what it does, I'll give you an example of what, what, what we did in East Athens. Uh, when I used to be in Athens, Georgia, what we did in East Athens, Georgia, you know, in terms of an intervention in a very distressed area in that particular city, we had, we had to spend some time, a certain amount of time, identifying those people. We conducted numerous interviews to find who those people are. And we went out of our way to bring them to the table. And we went through many types of challenges in terms of actually to get these people to come. We had to come bring them from the house. We had to do make babysitting arrangements beyond the normal expectations. Because we found that that is what we had to do for them to be on the table. Because we knew that the knowledge, they, they bring what we call the insider's knowledge to the table that has significant relevance in terms of the outcomes of implementation. Um, please chat, type in any more questions or raise your hands. Hey, Jack. Oh, you're on mute, Professor Jack, you're mute. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah um, on, the, on the theme of um, examples uh, uh, of places that are doing this uh, internationally, perhaps. Um, you know, Robert, Robert gave examples of, of Seattle and um, San Francisco. I talked about New York City. Um, you spoke about Austin, Texas. Um, any, any other examples that, and it seems everybody's talking about resilience and there must be a lot of good and bad work going on. And I'm wondering about, you know, nationally and internationally, uh, where you think that the best work is being done in this, in the kind of comprehensive holistic sense that you're advocating. Actually, I, 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 I can't talk about internationally per se. But I, there's some, there's some, a lot of good work that is done in California. And, and, and that's important because uh, it's part of the legislation and, and they're required to do it. Hmm. And so because of that, you find quite a, quite a significant variation in terms of uh, the, the work that they're doing. They're required to do it. And so, and, and, and when you're required to do it, it sets the framework for innovation because people with different capabilities and visionary framework will offer, do the same thing, but in different ways. So I'll look, I'll look at California because they've done quite a lot. We go to their climate action plans and, and, and see what they've done. So we have, in, in Massachusetts, we have, a, um, an active program, I believe it's called uh, Municipal Vulnerability Plans, and the, the state is giving funding. But as Robert mentioned, it, it's extremely decentralized, extremely. It's in, in our tiny little state, we have 351 communities, and that's the scale that it's done at. And to my knowledge, these plans um, do, not do not have a regional dimension to them. So it's... Um, you know, I think it's kind of catching on, you know, in the coastal areas, everybody's talking about sea level rise, um, probably in, in some uh, economically challenged areas, they're talking about bringing back employment. So it's, um, I think it's using the, 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 the idea of resilience, but my sense is that it's being um, kind of immediately focused on, on specific topics within the broader umbrella. My, my, my suggestion is that uh, because, just like you mentioned, because it's 
um, is so decentralized to the municipal level yeah. that uh, it becomes uh, problematic. And just as I think what Ryan mentioned, that, that perhaps um, one way or two, two things can be done. One is to systematically look for an issue that ties a number of those municipalities together. Yeah. And then use that as a framework for doing something. And then secondly, identifying a number of questions under the resiliency framework, whatever, that is kind of a, a test that communities will have to ask themselves, kind of a checklist, are, are we doing this? Yes. If not, why? How does it impact upon what currently exists or in the future? I think in, in that way then, um, it, it just like, it, it almost like a performance criteria, you know? Yeah. We expect you to do this. We, we don't care how you do it, but let's agree on what the potential outcomes would be. And then you guys figure out the way you're going to do it. <laughs> Good. It's, um, it's, a, it's a challenge here because it's, um, it's really in the DNA of our uh, political structure and our organization. And, you know, I think our state is, is progressive in many ways, but um, certainly not in this way. Um, so it's, it's a challenge to think at multiple scales. You guys are much better than us. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Yes, please, uh, Mark. I just wanted to uh, quickly mention that uh, even though there hasn't been as much regional coordination around uh, climate resilience or climate adaptation, there has been a lot around uh, climate mitigation. So there's a regional uh, greenhouse gas uh, inventory agreement um, among the Northeast states. Uh, there's, um, there, there are various partnerships that, you know, may have an impact on uh, resilience, but, but there hasn't been the same level of coordination around uh, planning and design on a regional scale um, as there is in terms of, you know, regulating emissions or a transition to renewable energy or, um, uh, promoting more um, low impact forms of development or growth management, stuff like that. So it's, it's kind of a mixed record where there is some regional cooperation, just not at this point around climate resilience per se. And I think Jack, Jack's point and Robert's point of the governance issues and, and the fact that resilience has been segment, segmented into different focus areas has, has limited the, uh, the opportunity to address it in a more coordinated sort of way. And I think you've provided a framework for thinking about how it can be addressed in a more coordinated way. Forrester, is this, um, is this framework going to be included in your new book? No. No, that's the next uh, not, book. Not, not, not this, not this, not this, not this, that's that one I'm working on, I'm halfway. I'll probably up next year. That that one, um, because that one has that one has a chapter that's specifically dealt with regional framework. Good. Yeah. Good. Well, I look forward to that. I think that's important work, and I, and I hope you can um, get that to completion. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments? Um, it seems like uh, people have left and uh, not many questions right now. Nobody has raised their hands or typed in a new question. Okay. Okay. That's good. So um, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, thanks again, Forrester. Um, we, we owe you one. We want to get you up back to Amherst uh, in person and, and, and sit down and show you around and, and uh, look at our landscape. Uh, and I wish you all the best with your, uh, with your teaching and, and your important work in publication. So thanks so much for, for giving us a lot to think about today. Thank you so much, it's an opportunity. Thank you. Very good. Take care. Okay, bye y'all.